The work of the Melbourne Press Club, the platform and support you provide for the discussion of ideas, issues and the craft of journalism are invaluable. Last year I attended the opening of the New South Wales chapter of the Australian Media Hall of Fame, a fantastic initiative by this forum to bring to a broader stage the great traditions of journalism and the women and men who, as journalists and storytellers, have left their mark on the fabric of Australia. Now, I'll demonstrate just a touch of ABC bias here. I was thrilled at the roll call of our journalists who were among those honoured that night. Mark Colvin, Ian Carroll, Carolyn Jones, Alan McGilvray, Chris Masters and Kerry O'Brien. These are hallowed names, as recognisable as ABC brands as our famous Lizardew logo. They and others acknowledged by the club have made an indelible contribution to our collective understanding of Australia and the world. We know and applaud their attributes and achievements, their deep knowledge of audiences and the issues that are relevant to the lives of the community, their relentless drive to ensure that the institutions and processes which are the foundations of our democratic system work to the benefit of that community their determination to provide a voice for the powerless, the weak and the intimidated, their ability to shine the light on malfeasance and corruption. What I also admire about them is their ability to get to the nub of an issue, to focus on its true implications and to frame it in terms that are easily understood by all Australians. In a complex world, it is too easy for the powerful to do their work in dark corners to cynically use so-called narrow-casting messages that have a direct appeal to certain targeted audiences while conveying an entirely different message to others and to rely on rhetoric that doesn't match actions. Good journalists call that out. Today I want to channel some of their skill and emphasise some real facts in what has become an increasingly febrile debate over the value and future of the ABC. This is a debate that affects real people. I talk here of my very valuable colleagues, many of whom are here today, who have displayed enormous resolve, dedication and commitment over the past few years in the face of continued criticism. But I also refer to the people of Australia who regard the ABC as one of the great national institutions and who deeply resent it being used as a punching bag by narrow political, commercial or ideological interests. I'm proud of the ABC and I'm proud of the work we do, the privileged position we hold in Australian history and our way of life, and of the value we bring not only to audiences but to the wider citizenry. My aim in this speech is to demonstrate that value and to dismantle some of the arguments that are being used by critics to attack the national public broadcaster. Now, as you know, the anti-ABC case has been crystallised in two recent developments. The launch of a tome by two people associated with the IPA calling for the sale of the national broadcaster, and last weekend's policy motion at the Liberal Party Federal Council meeting in Sydney demanding the privatisation of the ABC. The premise behind the policy motion, as stated by its advocates, is that there is no redeemable value in the public investment in the ABC. That the commercial media sector would benefit from a so-called level playing field and that the nation as a whole would be better off. That the market in the end will provide. Those very same arguments are being used to propel the competitive neutrality and efficiency reviews that have been imposed on the public broadcasters. So it would be negligent of me to ignore the policy motion even if others are keen to downplay it. The argument seems to carry a misplaced notion of both privatisation and conservatism. But more importantly, it completely ignores the public value of the ABC, both in direct dollar terms but also as far as the wider public good remit. What price do you put on public trust in an independent, commercial-free news organisation at a time of fragmentation and disruption. As the Prime Minister himself noted at the Liberal Party Council meeting, 
It's difficult to establish the facts in a disputed media landscape full of echo chambers and fake news outlets. What price do you put on an ABC devoted to serving the nation across its vast expanse and through a myriad of services with quality and distinctiveness as a hallmark? This at a time when the pressures of the new landscape are forcing our commercial colleagues into a relentless focus on their profitability. What price do you put on an almost 86 year history of service that has the ABC as one of the most respected and trusted institutions in the country? An institution that provides valuable diversity to the media sector and through its innovation, one that has driven many of the platforms and services that we know and take for granted. Just last week, we marked iView's 10th birthday. For years, the ABC stood alone in committing to a catch-up service, acknowledging that online presented a new way, free of schedules, for audiences to watch programs. The ABC has pioneered the use of websites to complement broadcasting in its commitment to podcasting and its use of apps and social media. I think the public regards the ABC as a priceless asset, more valuable now than ever in its history. Now, I can appreciate that the ABC would fetch a high price in a commercial market, but does the public want a new media organisation that compromises quality and innovation for profit? Frankly, does the commercial sector want a new advertising behemoth in its midst? I think not. Now, for those who prefer an abacus-type approach to this debate, I have some fresh information. How do you put a price on the value of the ABC? In pursuit of that answer, the ABC has commissioned Deloitte Access Economics to do some research. Their report is still being compiled and will be released next month, but the early findings are very interesting. They show that the ABC contributed more than a billion dollars to the Australian economy in the last financial year, on a par with the public investment in the organisation. So far from being a drain on the public purse, the audience, community and economic value stemming from the ABC activity is a real and tangible benefit. Of that billion dollars, more than a third is economic support for the broader media ecosystem. Far from being ultimo-centric, the ABC is boosting activity across the country. Recent examples include the filming of Mystery Road in the remote Kimberley region of Western Australia and the production of Rosehaven outside Hobart. Deloitte calculates that the ABC is helping to sustain more than 6,000 full-time equivalent jobs across the economy. It means that for every three full-time equivalent jobs created by the ABC, there are another two supported in our supply chain. Local artists, writers, technicians, transport workers and many more. In hard figures, the research shows that the ABC helps to sustain 2,500 full-time equivalent jobs in addition to the 4,000 women and men who are directly employed by the public broadcaster. So when broken down, this equates to more than 500 additional jobs in production companies, over 400 jobs elsewhere in the broadcast sector, and close to 300 full-time equivalent jobs in professional services. So amidst the debate over the ABC's purpose and its funding, we should all remember that there are 2,500 jobs outside public broadcasting at risk in any move to curtail our remit and our activities. The related argument is that the billion dollars is not well spent, that the ABC must be forced to live within its means. Again, let's go to the facts. Transmission costs to deliver the benefits of public broadcasting to all Australians are fixed and expensive. The actual amount that we have to spend on content is well below that billion dollars. The ABC's per capita funding has halved in real terms in 30 years. And technological change is demanding ongoing investment to meet rapidly changing audience needs. This financial year, 
92% of the ABC's budget will be spent on making content, supporting content makers and distribution. This is a result that we're very proud of and I suspect many of our commercial counterparts would aspire to. It is the direct result of strategic management and the pairing back of non-content related support costs. 30 years ago, the ABC had five platforms and 6,000 people working around the country. Today, your ABC has two-thirds the number of people operating six times the number of platforms and services with half the real per capita funding. ABC News Channel, iView, Triple J, Unearthed and Double J are just some of the services created from an ongoing drive to identify production and back office efficiencies and to pour that money back into content, rewarding our audiences. It was a strategy we employed so effectively last year, generating efficiencies that, financial, that financed our content innovation fund and regional investment. I'm concerned by the accusation that this latest 1% efficiency dividend can easily be accommodated by the ABC. It ignores the accumulation of efficiency taken by Canberra over the past four years and the fact that these efficiencies rob the ABC of its ability to finance new content and innovation. This whittling away of our funding represents a real opportunity cost and in the end serves only to punish our audiences. There are two other fallacies that need to be addressed. The first is that the ABC should be stripped back to servicing gaps in the media market, basically becoming a market failure operator. The second is that the ABC serves only sectional interests. Now, every day I'm reminded how important the ABC is to all Australians. Some commentators and politicians like to pigeonhole our audience as being of a particular political bent or social strata. In the two years since I've been in this role, I've been cons constantly reminded how wrong that is. Of course, there are the undisputed figures. The 12 million Australians who will watch ABC TV this week, the nearly 5 million who will listen to ABC radio, the 13 million ABC podcast downloads that now happen every single month. Now, if all those listeners and viewers were on the one side of politics, there wouldn't be much politicking left to do. I also note the findings of the recent Reuters digital news report. Australia may have an increasingly polarised media sector, but ABC television attracts viewers from across the political spectrum for its news coverage. This is really buttressed by my own experiences. Actually, last week as I was collecting lost luggage at the airport, the very helpful man behind the counter at, at uh, Qantas Baggage Services began by telling me, even before uh, he, he knew what I was after, telling me how much he loves the ABC. He said, I watch ABC News all the time. And then there's June in her mid-70s who lives on the New South Wales mid-north coast. She recently wrote to tell us that our gripping Mystery Road miniseries has seen her do an iView binge watch for the very first time. The first of many binges, I hope, June. It confirms for me what an important role the ABC plays for Australians, no matter their age, where they live or what they do. It's a strong, ongoing endorsement of the quality and diversity of the programs that we create and it shows that we are fulfilling our purpose, which is definitely not to play the role of a market failure operator. There really is no excuse for getting that wrong. If you take the time to read the charter, and it's not long, it's there in black and white. As the independent national public broadcaster, our purpose is to provide a balance between broadcasting programs of wide appeal as well as specialised interest. It means we're here to broadcast the New Year's Eve fireworks as we do every year, bringing together nearly four million Australian viewers. But we're also here to deliver award-winning children's content as well as ABC Jazz, Classic FM and much more. It's a balance between the two that we navigate with care and always with the needs of our audiences in mind. This is what public broadcasting is all about. 
it's not about profits or even ratings necessarily. It's about providing the distinctive programs that Australians, young and old, left and right, rich and poor, in Burke and in Brisbane, both want and need. Given what's happening on the global stage, that commitment is now more important than ever. In the US last week, the courts approved what's been called the mega merger between Time Warner and AT&T. The new company will be worth an estimated $143 billion and will have a vast content library that it will own and distribute. In fact, every one of the five largest global media organisations are pursuing mergers in order to build scale for survival. In the face of such consolidation, in all likelihood, over a very short sp space of time, there may be just a handful of international media giants. And yes, I'm including the fangs, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google in that group, that will be based in the US and will create and distribute the vast majority of the world's content, both news and entertainment. What does this mean for Australia? And what does it mean in Australia? It means original Australian content and Australian voices will be more valuable than ever. It also means that the pressure on our domestic commercial media counterparts is only going to increase. Two years ago, Facebook and Google were already collecting 40% of Australian advertising dollars. Those dollars would previously have gone to traditional television, radio and print media operators. The figure will only have increased since then. This and the increasing competition for content from the global players, each with a production budget in the billions, is driving the free to airs to adopt play-safe strategies, trying to secure big audiences around tentpole events in news, reality and sports. Amid all of this upheaval, Australia has a strong, independent public broadcaster, driven by women and men who create original, distinctive and high quality Australian content every day, all over the country. It's an organisation that contributes as much as a billion dollars annually to Australia's creative and broader industries, that directly employs 4,000 Australians and helps to sustain jobs for 2,500 more, that provides the only Australia-wide platform for our national conversations, culture and stories. It isn't by luck that this exists. It's thanks to the collective vision of Australians nearly 86 years ago. They decided to create a public broadcast service to operate alongside the commercial media, increasing the diversity available for everyone. So much has changed about our world since then, but the basic premise for the ABC remains the same. And the facts show Australians overwhelmingly value the outcome of this foresight. 82% of Australians look to the ABC as their trusted source of information. 78% cite the ABC as an important contributor to our national identity. And critically, 77% of Australians think a healthy ABC is essential for Australia's future. That regard is a precious commodity at a time when trust in our institutions is so rare. Next week, we'll make our submission to the government's competitive neutrality inquiry, looking at the role of the ABC and the SBS and how we operate alongside our commercial counterparts. I'm confident that we're operating in accordance with our charter and the principles of com competitive neutrality as they apply to public service broadcasting. We're a distinct and important part of Australia's modern media ecosystem. I'm proud of our contribution and the women and men who create it. As the Charter requires, we take into account the services commercial broadcasters provide. We invest in material that is distinctive and original and which is of both wide appeal and specialised interest. And alongside 9, 10, 7 and Foxtel, we provide an independent alternative. I was one of the more than million viewers who chose to watch Mystery Road a few Sunday nights ago instead of an interview with Barnaby Joyce. Who knew Australians would choose a well-scripted and produced drama over the kitchen sink exploits of a politician? 
well-told local drama remains a priority for the ABC and clearly provided a welcome option for many Australians that evening. Before finishing, I'd like to describe another recent program that I think epitomises the value of what the ABC provides. Over three nights last month, the second series of Stargazing Live brought together 2.6 million viewers and 46,000 amateur astronomers. In the process, we broke a Guinness World Record and discovered a new supernova that may help to recalibrate the age of the universe. All over the country, Australians gathered in their backyards, school playgrounds and local parks to gaze together at the moon for 10 minutes. In Wadena, South Australia, more than half the town's population took part. Tens of thousands of Australians were introduced to new astronomical knowledge. For many, it's changed the way they look at the stars forever. And with the recent launch of the new Australian Space Agency, there's a possibility that perhaps more than one of our future homegrown astronauts was taking part somewhere. Who else but the ABC would even attempt such a broadcast? As a nation, we could choose not to have the ABC, or we could hobble it so that it becomes the market failure organisation it was never intended to be. Inherent in the drive against the independent public broadcaster is a belief that it can be pushed and prodded into different shapes to suit the prevailing climate. It can't, nor should it be. The ABC's great value is its ability to call on its composite strengths to service the nation. History elsewhere has shown that if you start tampering with the formula, you risk destroying it. And as I hope I've demonstrated today, the nation would suffer as a consequence. Each of the ABC journalists celebrated by the MPC's Media Hall of Fame at last year's ceremony had made important contributions to our national conversations. It would be a step back, especially in these turbulent times, if future journalists found it more difficult to make such important contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, now we have about 35 minutes for questions and answers. I'm going to start with some working journalists first and throw the questions out to the wider room. And we have some journalists uh, to my right. Uh, Madeline. Hi, Michelle. I'm Madeline from ABC. Um, a couple of questions. One, if you could break down, first of all, the details of that $1 billion, is that, is that primarily in the additional jobs that you're talking about which are created? If you could just give us a bit more detail into that. In terms of the, the, the billion dollars um, uh, additional. Identified, uh, identified by Deloitte, Correct. we'll have to wait for the report next month. Okay. Uh, so so we will, we'll be making that, that report public around that additional billion dollars, but, but it will all be in the Deloitte uh, access economics report. Okay. The other question was around your own leadership. Mm. You have been criticised um, by some within the organisation and outside the organisation as not being the right person at this particular time um, to defend the ABC and for your interactions with government. What would you say to those criticisms? Huh. <laughs> so, so, look, I think, you know, the, the key thing for me is, is, I guess, looking at my record. And, and I'm not... You know, it's, it's for others to judge whether, whether I'm a good managing director or not. But ultimately, I look at, at what we have achieved over the last two years. We have fundamentally um, uh, achieved, you know, even more efficiency um, in, the, in the last two years and identified, you know, close to $70 million um, that has been invested, 20 million of that in regional Australia, so 80 new jobs in regional Australia. Uh, the greatest investment we've made in, in regional Australia in the ABC's history. Uh, and it's making a real difference already. Uh, second is creating a content innovation fund, um, which was really about, about making available um, funding for, for you know, um, great new uh, content and innovations. One of the, one of the examples of that has, that's already been launched is, is uh, Unravel, our, our podcast 
together with um, Australian Story, together with a whole lot of digital treatment. And it's, it's, it's the breaking down the silos between, between our radio, television uh, uh, and digital silo, uh, you know, platforms that was, that was really critical. Uh, um, and I guess you know, the, the last was really making sure that we have a great plan for the future. And that is all about you know, investing in the core. Um, making sure that we've, we've actually invested more in investigative journalism. We've invested more in Four Corners. We've invested more in, in those things that really matter, you know, including Gardening Australia. We ch changed Gardening Australia from a half-hour program into a, you know, an hour program on a Friday night that's doing incredibly well. So there have been lots of investments and lots of great new initiatives. I don't think that anyone would dispute that. But the question is also around the cuts, um, which we have seen, and uh, whether you might have been able to do more to preempt those in your <laughs> relations with government um, and to criticisms that um, you're not uh, as comfortable with government as the previous managing director. So, so, so look, I will... You know, part of the reason I was, um, uh, you know... More, more than more than concerned about the way in which the last budget was handed down, was those those you know the budget freeze um, happened you know or, or is going to take effect from the first of July 2019. Frankly, before we even you know get into real conversations with with the government about our three-year triennial funding requirements and our funding requirements into the into the future, so. You, Obviously, we are we are continuing those conversations, but I think that preemptive um, uh, announcement around around the indexation freeze in on the first of July was was unprecedented. And still in the media pack, if you could just say your name and where you're from as well. Yeah. Hi, Michelle. Nick Toscano from the Age. Um, the sentiment of your speech seems to suggest that the, you believe the threat to the ABC is is real. Do you believe the Prime Minister when he assures us that the ABC will never be sold off, or do you think this is a debate that has real consequences? Yeah, so, so look, I, I guess what I was really trying to get across in, in the, the, um, the speech was that the, the conversation around privatisation or, or selling off the ABC is frankly the, the same arguments that are being run around um, you know, whether we're needed in the first place. And I think that it's really cutting to the core of, of those arguments. And so, look, I, I absolutely believe the Prime Minister when he says that, that um, you know, privatisation under, under the current government won't, won't happen. But I think, you know, it's, it's more than that. Um, they were really the, um, you know, frankly, the, the beginnings of, of um, those conversations were, were, were founded in this idea of, of why do we need a public broadcaster when we have commercial operations? Um, and I think it fundamentally misses the point about the purpose of, of public broadcasting. Thank you. Yes, uh, another question over here. Michelle Piney, Independent Australia. Um, I just wanted to ask you regarding uh, this issue of uh, creeping, I suppose, criticism from both sides of politics. And certainly the current communications uh, minister has been very vocal in his criticism of the ABC. Um, some have suggested that there's been an increasing need then to balance that by creating a more uh, conservative, if you like, approach uh, to current affairs. Would you say that that's true? And if so, how can that be safeguarded uh, regardless of the colour of politics? <laughs> yeah, let, let, let me sort of start, start with, uh, I guess, the premise of your question. Um, the, you know, my, my view is the Minister has the right like every other Australian, to express a view about, about ABC content. And we have our processes to deal with complaints and, and these are being followed. And let me also put that complaint in some context. Since the start of the year, we've, had, we've received about seven complaints from the Minister and the Prime Minister's office regarding a total of nine pieces of content online and on radio and on television. Over the same period, the ABC has broadcast approximately a quarter of a million hours of content across TV and radio and posted more than 15,000 articles on news, ABC News Online. So, you know, in, in most cases so far, the complaints have already been found to be, by our, independence, our independent complaints review processes, to be without basis. And, and while no, um, you know, mistakes should be, should be excused, um, it is about you know putting all of that in in context with the the great volume of of um, you know content that we create. 
Uh, Richard, yeah. Uh, uh, Richard Ferguson from the Australian, Ms. Guffrey, thank you very much for your speech. Um, just to address the, dare I say, morning host-sized elephant in the room, um, have you spoken to Mr. John Fain about his criticisms of upper management? And if not, do you have a message for him today? Do you think that you, he, you've shown that you are fighting for the ABC? <laughs> John, John is a great broadcaster and, um, you know, what, what is fantastic about, about John and, you know, with, with so many of our other, other amazing broadcasters is that they're having the conversations or leading the conversations that matter to people. And the great thing about the ABC is we matter. Um, when, when you see all of the, the, you know, the attention that has been placed on us, not just in the last week, but over you know months and years, it is fantastic to be relevant, um, and I think it is important that that from time to time I come out and remind people about what we're here for, um, and I think you know that was the, the purpose of this speech today to remind people of of you know what the ABC is here for, um, and really correct some some uh, misconceptions around that. Okay, let's uh, toss it out to the wider room. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ted Lapkin. Uh, conservatives see an ABC that's dominated by political monoculture that runs the gamut from the ALP's socialist left to the Greens. We remain unconvinced by blithe denials of political bias from Justin Milne and your predecessor, Mark Scott, who dismissively declared, we don't ask questions about our journalist voting patterns. You're devoid of even a single presenter whose worldview derives from conservative values, and no, Tom Switzer, whose opinions on foreign policy are akin to those of Sarah Hansen Young, doesn't qualify. You claim to foster a culture of diversity, but your definition of that term revolves solely around skin pigmentation, reproductive anatomy, and sexual preference. Okay, Ted, do you want to get, get yeah, to... Yeah, I'm getting let, to the point. Let's, let's get to a question quick, smart, okay. otherwise when I'll toss it around to somebody else. When it comes to ideological else. diversity, the ABC is a barren desert. Do you see this as a problem? And if so, what are you going to do to rectify it? So, so again, let me, let me go back to, to the facts. The facts are that we reach 85% of Australians on a, on a monthly basis. The facts are that we reach 72% of Australians on a weekly basis. Now, again, you know, I, I know that... that you know, people don't like me pointing this out, but that is more popular than the, the two major parties combined. So the idea that we are, you know, um, representing a, an extreme ideological view is inconsistent with the, the, the reach and the impact and the relevance we have every day, every week, every month. Yes, at the back there. Uh, Tony Thomas from Quadrant and Spectator. Uh, Would-be comedian Greg Larson uh, last uh, March described Australian Conservatives candidate Kevin Bailey as a cunt. I listened for four minutes to the segment and there were two fucks and eight cunts. The segment had been uh, vetted beforehand, before it went to air by management, and it complied with ABC editorial and classification standards. How can you support such standards? We're not going out live, are we? <laughs> so, so that is that is certainly an issue that that has been subject to an independent um, investigation, and it's also been referred to um, ACMA for for uh, review and determination. So, you know, you know, it is important to to make sure that we reflect community standards, but it's also important to understand the context in which that, that is done. So, you know, what is appropriate on the 7 p.m. news or what is appropriate um, on Play School is very different to what's appropriate in a program, um, a comedy program at 9 p.m. or now 9.30 uh, on, you know, on our, on our comedy channel. And so that is something that, that, you know, we have to be reflective of community standards. But it isn't one size fits all, and it very much depends on the context. But it, it is something that, that will ultimately um, uh, be determined by ACMA. Thank you, uh, Alex. Yes. 
Hi, Alex Wake from RMIT's journalism faculty, as opposed to other academics at RMIT. Um, I'm interested not so much in this current debate, but all about where you've come from in your history and, and past, <laughs> and how important Australia is in the region. I want to change mm. the conversation from these attacks to do you think the ABC needs a funding boost in light of what's going on in our region? Yes. And, <laughs> but specifically, and, and I feel watching the ABC that the ABC is being penalised for being very good in the digital space. <laughs> so I want to know what the plans are for the ABC, and in particular in the light of what's going on around us and that current debate. Ah, very, very good questions. Uh, and, and, you know, something that's very dear to my heart. Let's, let's deal with kind of, you know, international and Asia-Pacific first. As, as you know, um, I spent a lot of time in, in Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and all through Asia. And I, you know, I actually think that... Australian, you know, creativity and and you know news and storytelling is is so um, important across the region. Not just, you know, um, I, actually, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I had have a lot of, of uh, friends in China whose favourite program is Landline, because you know their first reaction is there are no people in Australia. <laughs> it's just you have these beautiful, beautiful, um, uh, you know, programs like Landline. Um, you know, Mystery Road is another one which is, is extraordinary because it really shows who we are as, as Australians. Backroads is another, is another one of those. So I do think that actually, um, uh, you know, having that, that um, presence in, in Asia is incredibly important for Australia um, and is as, in, as important from a soft power perspective as, as almost everything that we do. I am hopeful um, that, that we can um, pursue some, some additional funding around um, supporting our, our outreach to, to, um, to Asia. Obviously, we have a, a network uh, currently there, but I think what we're aiming to do is, frankly, almost globalise everything that we do. Um, so in the same way that, you know, you can access iView now in, in Australia, there's no reason, you know, that we couldn't have a cut-down version of iView available wherever you are. Actually, you know, most people have figured out that that actually all of our podcasts and radio streaming works wherever you are. Um, obviously, you know, News Digital and, and all the things we do on ABC Online is... is um, uh, is also sort of, you know, um, incredibly um, attractive to, to not just an Asian audience but a global audience. One of my favourite stats is I think 93% of the traffic to the ABC Science website comes from outside of Australia. So it really shows you that ability to, to reach out beyond, beyond our own shores and, and it's actually in the charter that we are, we are intended to do that. So I'm, you know... We are doing things ourselves to, to make that happen, but, but I would, I, you know, think that it's certainly worthwhile having um, more of a conversation with, with DFAT, and, and we already have a, a great relationship with DFAT about trying to extend that even further. And then on, on your, um, I guess on, on your second point, I mean, um, I think the key thing around the future is, um, is kind of a couple of things. One is that while, so we, we have always been very strong in, in radio and, and television. And, you know, we are not, um, you know, going to, to pivot off that, that strength in, in um, radio or television anytime soon. I mean, we'll be continuing our radio and television services for many, many, many years to come. But it is really important that we go where our audiences are. And increasingly, our audiences are on mobile. Our audiences are, are on third-party platforms like Facebook and YouTube and and uh, and it's and Snapchat. And it's important that as as an Australian content creator, we should actually um, use those third-party platforms to, to reach our audiences wherever they are. That being said, we can't be at the at the um, uh, I, I guess at the whims of. of changes in business model of, of some of those global giants or, you know, changes in algorithm or other things. So it's really important that we, that we really invest in our own platform as well. And I am very confident that as we, as we invest in that modernisation of the ABC, where we really connect 
our you know, catch-up services like iView, together with our podcasts, together with our stream services, together with you know, News Online, together with our television channels, it, it is a pretty compelling proposition and it doesn't have advertising. So you know, if we can, can really um, uh, invest for the future, around that, that Australian platform. And I think it's important to think of it not just as an ABC platform, but as an Australian platform, because the whole purpose is to make sure that, that partners that we have, like the Opera House, Sydney Opera House, or the Australian Ballet, um, can, can actually you know, use that, that platform to, to reach audiences as well. Thank you for the question, Alex. Yeah, Patricia. Uh, thanks for your speech, Michelle. Patricia Carvellis from RN. Um, the government has obviously paused the ABC's indexation, so it's an effective budget cut. Is the ABC now planning around where those cuts may come from? Are you making plans about what might go under, under that plan? Yeah, I, again, you know, I think it might be useful if I give you give some context because, you know, again, a number of, of um, commentators say, well, it's only $84 million and, and you know, uh, having a freeze is, is, you know, just being efficient. We never actually had full indexation anyway. We always had indexation minus. So efficiency was built into everything that we did. On top of that, we're still working our way through the 2014 budget cut. So from 1st of July 2018 through to, to um, uh, you know, um, the end of that financial year, we're actually handing back $50 million in efficiencies as, as that last instalment of the 2014 cuts. So in that context, um, at the same time as, as we have had our, our funding frozen for, um, uh, you know, under the, the uh, latest budget, we also have content costs escalating. Um, you know, I think even, even the, the commercial operators are really saying that drama um, the cost of, of producing drama is increasing by by six percent a year. Um, I think that that's pretty conservative. Uh, so as we're trying to increase, you know, our investment in Australian um, programming, as we're trying to increase our investment in Australian drama and, and children's content, then you know, trying to to do that at the same time as as having um, flat funding is pretty difficult. And I think we really have reached the point where further um, cuts will really impact content, services and ultimately jobs. So we're 12 months out from, from um, that being a reality, but obviously we're, we're working through that. Uh, question here, sir. Yeah, I think I'll get a microphone to the corner. Uh, Johnny Walker, ABC Reunion Club. Michelle, earlier you mentioned about the competitive neutrality study that you were engaged in. Uh, first, I don't think anyone's silly enough to try and imagine that we'd sell the ABC anyway, but the fact is that, that a, a competitive neutrality study is fairly serious. And I just wondered if you could share with us any of the key benchmarks of that study, or is it sort of a bit preempting that? Yeah, I mean, obviously the competitive neutrality inquiry is, is really a government initiative, and of course, we're participating fully in the inquiry will be We'll be putting in our submission um, fairly soon. And, and as I said before, I'm confident that we're complying with Commonwealth um, competitive neutrality policy. You know, that being said, I, you know, I, I, I take your point. I think in our view, the inquiry's terms of reference and the issues paper accompanying it really go beyond the scope of the principles of competitive neutrality. And, and it really seeks to look into the ABC's core broadcasting and content functions and explore our digital offering. Um, and so, you know, um, as I said, while we will be providing a submission to the panel um, next week, I, I worry that, you know, the review seeks to explore complaints made by commercial broadcasters. Um, and, you know, as, as I said in, in the speech, I'm confident we can show that the ABC doesn't crowd out commercial operators. Uh, yeah, Jim, there at the back. Oh, <laughs> Ranald, sorry. Sorry, Ranald MacDonald, um, uh, really of ABC Friends, but... Michelle, thank you for what you said today. I thought it was really important. But I want to ask you two very basic questions. One is, uh, Michelle uh, uh, Grattan referred to the relentless stalking of the Murdoch media of the ABC. And, uh, and uh, the government has got a number of bills which are being discussed. So you've got the inquiries, you've got various other pressures on you. Do you feel that you are under siege as an organisation? 
And the second question really relates to the very good earlier question, and that is, uh, when you came into the job, you made a comment about how surprised you were and disappointed you were by the, uh, the democratic deficit, I think it was, <laughs> of voices outside in the, in the world and of Australia not being there. So the two questions, Siege, and secondly, are you really confident that we can get back in as Australians to have a voice to our north? Uh, so let me let me deal with your first point, Ronald. Um, uh, I don't think we're under siege or at war because I look at those numbers with our Australian audiences and think, you know, we we concentrate on delivering value to Australians. And you know, while there's a lot of noise, and and you know, I want to make sure that none of the noise impacts the trust that people have in us it is important that we continue to focus on delivering for our Australian audiences because that's what, what you know, ensures our longevity for, for generations to come. Um, I think on the second point, I, you know, I think we, we talked about that at the, at the Friends of the ABC uh, dinner, that, that I do think that it is really important for, for Australia to be participating in a, in a much more overt way in business, in society, in community, all around Asia, in, because we're part of Asia. Um, I've always felt that, and I think you know um, there are you know not enough I think links that we that we have across multiple um, touch points, and and I think that the ABC can really be a leader in that in that connection, particularly around around culture and, and information. Uh, speaking of noise, and apologies, Richard, but uh, Michelle, what, what do you make of the relentless and ill-founded daily assault on the ABC by the Australian newspaper? Uh, yeah, some, someone pointed out to me that Lee Sales has more Twitter followers than Read the Australian, so, so I think we're okay. Um, <laughs> um, look, I, I do think we have to put it in context, right? I mean, I do think that it is incredibly important for us to not be distracted by noise. Um, you know, I, I'm very, very focused on delivering um, for Australians um, with, the, with the ABC and with the amazing people that work here um, in a way that, that fundamentally protects its future for my daughters and my daughter's daughters. And, and I think that, that, you know, it's very easy to get distracted and we can't, we can't afford to do that. The, the real issue is really the Facebooks, Amazons, you know, Googles of this world, Netflix, who just um, have so much more capacity to, to invest uh, and so much more capacity around their, their uh, technological in innovation. And unless we keep up, our audience is going to desert us and it's really important that we, that we you know, invest. Got five or so minutes left. Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Sorry, can I? Oh, uh, where are you? Oh, uh, yes, Richard. Sorry, then the relentlessly stalking Murdoch Media <laughs> and Miss Guffrey. Um, and by the way, Michael's thing about the Twitter numbers really, really gets to me. Um, <laughs> Miss Guffrey, are you concerned at all that um, ABC staff speaking um, very passionately um, against privatisation may come into conflict with the spirit of impartiality, considering that the Labour Party plans to make the ABC a very key election um, battleground? Well, if, if the Labour Party is making us an election battleground, I don't, I don't think they're, they're simply listening to what the Australian people really want. Um, I think that the key thing for me is, of course, every one of our broadcasters um, should, be, should be very passionate about about the importance of what we do. Um, and that doesn't mean com you know, coming out and expressing their own views, but it does mean actually you know, having that conversation. And you know, I thought that, that the, the way that Tony Jones handled that on Q&A last night with, with uh, the panel, I think, was, was a great example of that. Mr John Fane. Michelle, I've been called many things, but an elephant in the room is really <laughs> something else. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your talk today, and no one could be more pleased than me to see you do it. In fact, we need a lot more of it, surely. And I, just as one staff member, but I know I speak for many, we do not understand why you are so reluctant 
to do more of what you've just done today. We need a champion. We need a public champion, not a managing director who hides from the media or from public engagement. The public own us. We have to engage with them, and that's what we look to you to do. Are you prepared to do more? So, so John, I, I wouldn't say anything ab about, um, you know, I, I wouldn't agree at all with you when, when you say that I hide from the media. I think well, I've been... I, I can't get you on my I, show, nor, but... nor can any of my <laughs> colleagues or rivals, I might say. So, so, look, I think that the key thing for me is to deliver. Um, it, it really is about delivering. And I do think it is important from time to time to correct those, those misconceptions. I'm also one of those people that thinks that the more you speak, the less you're heard. Um, I really do fundamentally believe that, that you know, actually um, speaking with impact is really important. And, and that doesn't mean I think I have to do it every week, but, but I think you will be seeing more of me, you know, whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh, yes, over here. Hi, Michelle. Ben Ansel from The Age. Um, just want to ask your opinion on the argument from the IPA. I think it was John Roskam was on Radio National yesterday um, just talking about the benefits of privatising Australian media. Can you just make a comment on that? Uh, I'll, I'll have to, it's like standard estimates. I'll have to take that on notice. I, I, I didn't hear that. Um, look, I, I think that, that, again, in the same, in the same way that I, I referred to in, in my speech, I think it's really important to to um, really highlight what are the things that we're trying to solve for. Um, and ultimately, you know, the idea that we are not necessary um, because commercial media is already operating in that space is just fundamentally not the purpose of the ABC. It's never been a market value operator and it, and it, and it should never be. Um, I think the second piece is, is you know, that the idea of, of having an, an, you know, a privatised um, ABC, again, fundamentally sort of isn't what our audiences and what Australians want and fundamentally, frankly, is not what commercial you know, news or media organisations want either. We're just about a uh, sweary man. Just keep it very, very short, sure. very short, and then we'll wrap it up. The BBC's last annual report discloses the pay of its 20 top news and current affairs presenters. The BBC, since 2009, has published the salaries of all its 106 executives on £150,000 plus and their expense claims and their gifts. So what's the problem with disclosing ABC managers and presenters' salaries likewise? Uh, so, so this is this is a, an issue that is currently, um, uh, you know, the subject of, of a proposed bill. Um, I'll, you know, go back to, to some basics, I guess. One is um, I don't think you were you were correct to say that it's the the top twenty uh, presenters. Is it actually is is um, you know my salary. My, my um, friend uh, Louise Higgins, the Chief Financial and Strategy Officer um, salary, as well as, as our directors, as well as um, at the heads of our content um, teams. Frankly, that disclosure is more than um, disclosure than is, is um, you know, provided by private media organisations or, or you know, publicly listed media organisations. On top of that, it's more than the disclosure required um, by the public service. So, you know, we have been very clear in saying that that um, you know our our highest paid presenter is is paid a fraction of what the highest paid presenter is is um, paid at the at the uh, BBC. I think we've also been very clear that we have no gender pay gap at any level within the ABC, and that's important to, to set out as well. But I think anything more than that is, is really um, going to not only impact our ability to, to retain our, our staff, but also, frankly, it invades their privacy in ways that, that are completely unacceptable. And we'll leave it there. We'll have to wrap it up. What a, what a crowd. If you have to choose, Michelle, between this audience and Senate Estimates, what would you say? Oh, I don't know. I, is, uh, I, th I think this, I think, uh, this is more welcoming, put it that way. Right.